Well, good morning. Uh, today, uh, in our first video, uh, I told you that uh, we would start in uh, each video with a question. And today's question is, it's been 60 years. Why is there still a fascination with JFK? Um, this is a question a lot of my students have asked over the years. Of course, it always hasn't been the same number, 60 years, but uh, it is now. And the fascination with JFK doesn't seem to dissipate. I keep waiting for, uh, as a teacher, I keep waiting for the time that my students are no longer as interested in the JFK assassination as previous years. And it never happens. They're always interested. And it's not just students. I can be in conversation with somebody who finds out I wrote a JFK book and boy, immediately the conversation turns. I can be at a family function and somebody wants to talk about it. I can be out to eat and somebody hits me up. It is ever present. It's one of those triggers that uh, people remember where they were. They remember what they've been taught. They remember they, they have their own theories about it. They want to discuss it. They want to talk about it. And uh, especially if you can somehow make it relevant to today, uh, it's a fascinating topic. People just can't seem to get enough of it. And one of the reasons JFK lives on in the memory of most Americans, most people around the world, actually, is that he, he was cut down in his youth, relatively speaking. He was a young man when he died. And uh, there's just something tragic about that, especially when you add in the mystery, the shroud of mystery around his death. Uh, but he was young, he was beautiful, he had a, a beautiful family, as you can see, he had a, a very a glamorous wife, two young children. Uh, we've never in America had a tradition of royalty. In fact, that's what we fought our revolution to get away from, the idea of having a king or a queen or a royal family. But if there is a family in American history that's come closest to the Kennedy family. People are uh, consumed with, you know, any little tidbit of information they can get about the Kennedy family, it sells. It's it's just something people are interested in. And, uh, you know, if you look at their family, especially as, with respect to JFK in particular, they're wealthy, okay? They, they came from privilege. Uh, they're all well-educated, JFK not excluding that. He was very well-educated. And they were all successful um in different in relative ways and to relative degrees they've been very successful uh obviously jfk his father joe kennedy was very successful in business became a diplomat and was on track to become president he that was his goal and daddy joe got himself in a little trouble when he was ambassador in london because this was before world war ii and he came off as being a Nazi sympathizer. It was thrown in his face. He was eventually fired as ambassador by FDR, came home and realized his chance to become president was gone. And so he's gonna plow all his energies into his sons. As you can see here, uh, JF on the left. If you're looking at the picture on the top, JF on the left, Bobby in the middle. And actually that was JFK's older brother, Joe, uh, and then Teddy. And there was a Bobby in there as well. He's not pictured. But there was a lineage there that Daddy Joe wanted to exploit and see if they couldn't become successful in politics to a larger degree than he, even he had been. They were war heroes. JFK himself rescued uh, a group of men when his PT boat was attacked. It was uh, run over in the middle of the night by a Japanese destroyer. They ended up in the middle of the, in the Pacific at night swimming for their lives. JFK was a strong swimmer and the legend is he put the, the uh, life preserver of one of his injured mates in his mouth between his teeth and he swam to Plum Island leading other men to safety. Uh, I, I read an account once where he talked about the loneliness of that night swim and how there was really no guarantee that they were swimming in any particular direction where there was land. And he was afraid the current was take, going to take him out to sea. But nevertheless, he kept swimming. And so did his, his men. So he was a war hero. Uh, they were winners. JFK, when he ran for election, he won. 
Um, and America viewed them as winners. I guess when you come from wealth and privilege and then you run for public office and you win, people view you as a winner. They were beautiful. All their family looks like they were carved out of butter. Uh, they all have that big wide smile, the ruddy complexion, the full head of hair. Uh, they're all trim and athletic looking, even though they really weren't athletic, especially JFK. Uh, and of course, JFK, in his case, he married a very glamorous beauty queen, Jacqueline, and they were youthful. And America was coming off the oldest presidency, or oldest president we've ever we'd ever had to that point, Dwight Eisenhower and his wife. And we were moving from an older generation in the 50s to the 60s, baby boomers. And so America is going through a change demographically as far as its age is concerned. And the leadership reflected that. When President Kennedy became president, he he was our youngest president. So our youngest president succeeds our oldest president. So instantly the Oval Office goes from a, uh, a grandfatherly place with all the trappings of old age and uh, to a very young, young father and all the energy of a young family. Uh, here you see John Jr. and Caroline romping through the Oval Office. They had pets and dogs and animals. And it was just a completely different dynamic. And uh, so that's another reason people were fascinated. Speaking of the baby boom generation, you know, we've had other baby booms. Uh, according to uh, statistics, you know, about every 100 years in the United States, we have a, a baby boom, relatively speaking, but none could touch the baby boom of the post-World War II generation. These were children that were born in the immediate aftermath of two crises. Uh, some would argue the two most grave, the gravest crisis Americans have ever faced other than the Civil War, but the Great Depression and World War II back to back. You can imagine the parents of that baby boom generation having come through the Great Depression and World War II, grown up in that, and now having children of their own the relief they must feel after they come home from the war, having survived all that. And, and now we're entering into the fifties and a decade of relative prosperity. There is a belief now that we've come through the worst and everything, the best is yet to come. Anything is possible. And this generation, as it grows up, grows up in a completely different uh, climate in America than their parents' generation. The parents' generation grew up in a time of crisis. Yeah, they were probably always hungry because they lived during the Great Depression. And then if you were a boy, uh, you looked forward to the to the day you were drafted into the military, probably wouldn't come home from the worst war in, in world history. So now juxtapose that with your children's generation. Their aspirations are to go to college. Their aspirations are to get a car. Their aspirations are to go dance down to SACOP. Uh, it's just a completely different dynamic than what their parents faced. And though JFK himself was not a baby boomer, he was young, he was youthful, and he appealed to these kids. Uh, this is the largest generation of, you're talking about kids that are going to college. And uh, after the baby boomers, which was the largest generation of American youth that ever went to college, now their kids are going off to college, and that's going to even be a larger a chunk of the population and so they're young they're energetic they're politically active or at least they have dreams and they need a candidate whom they can put all their hopes and dreams into and jfk seemed to be that guy this is an 82 million member generation and they got to claim somebody and if you look at you know the choice in the 1960 election was jfk or richard nixon well richard nixon came of age politically in the Eisenhower administration, he was young too, but people associated him with his boss, Dwight Eisenhower, the old president. And he was, the, he was, whether it's fair or not, Nixon was viewed as the past and JFK was the future. JFK represented to these kids, youth, vigor, vision. He was progressive and uh, they projected onto him their idealism and they, uh, they weren't disappointed. You know, when JFK was running for president, 
he talked about things that these kids cared about. He talked about civil rights. Now, he changed on civil rights quite a bit. What he talked about and how he governed later were different. He was he minimized it when he was campaigning because he realized he needed Democrat votes in the South. And of course, Democrats were not in the South were not prone to want to support civil rights. But he did mention it. And then he, he later came through in a big way in that area. Uh, he talked about women's rights. You know, one of the first acts he did as president was get the Equal Pay Act passed, equal pay for women for the same job that men are doing. He talked about nuclear weapons. And this was a burning issue on the front of every young person's mind. You know, the, the, if there was a specter of, of dismay or hopelessness that this young generation had, it was the thought of nuclear annihilation. You know, they didn't have a Great Depression or World War II, but there was always this prospect of nuclear annihilation because we're in a Cold War and Americans and the Soviets in this race to build nuclear weapons. Somebody has to come along who's sane and propose a, a, a way out of this mess that we're in where one person hits the wrong button and the world is destroyed. And JFK seemed to be that candidate. Uh, now, it's going to be tricky because you can't be seen as weak when you confront communism. Uh, you can't be uh, a pacifist. You can't be uh, somebody who's willing to uh, lay aside our nuclear advantage and give the Soviets a chance to catch up or even pass us. So somehow you've got to find somebody who's smart enough who can thread the needle still be tough on communism and the, and the threat that communism posed to the world, but at the same time, propose a sane approach to nuclear weapons. Another thing that uh, JFK really grasped a hold of once he became president and the baby boom generation really uh, bought into was this idea that there's a new frontier. In fact, he called his, his social program, the new frontier. And, uh, I want to move my face here so you can see the picture. And uh, his idea was, we're going to go to the moon. Now, understand, the Soviets had already sent a, uh, a satellite into space in 57. And in 61, they sent a, a cosmonaut into space. We couldn't even get rockets off the launch pad. There's all kinds of images of, of uh, American rockets uh, getting 20, 30, 50 feet off the launch pad, turning around and exploding in midair or into the ground. We could not get a rocket off the launch pad. And, and Kennedy gives a speech famously where he says, we're not only going to put a, a man into space and orbit the earth, we are going to put a man on the moon by the end of this decade. And some people thought he was crazy. Um, he also said, you know, instead of the Soviet approach to expansion, which is to conquer and divide and build walls and things of that nature, we're going to send a Peace Corps out especially in our hemisphere to Latin America, South America, a Peace Corps of college volunteers are going to go out and build, build hospitals and clinics and teach and be doctors and anything that these people need. We're going to be like missionaries. It's going to be America's missionary project to go out and win hearts and minds, to stay on our side, the free side, the West side, rather than convert to communism and become a Soviet puppet. So this was projecting American strength, not through military power, but through uh, volunteer action by regular citizens. And then, of course, part of his new frontier was uh, his approach to civil rights, which was to protect freedom riders, which was to protect James Meredith, who could enroll at Old Miss, which was to protect uh, marchers in Birmingham and you know, in, in 1963, JFK proposed the most sweeping civil rights legislation in the history of our country, gave a big speech and says the moral issue of our time. Now, this is flying in the face of his own party. You have to understand uh, his own party was angry with him. He seemed like a sellout to them. Here he is supporting uh, civil rights. And Democrats didn't support civil rights in those days. And, but the young people saw that as the future. And so they appreciated the fact that here was a man a leader who was courageous, who was talking about nuclear disarmament, he was talking about peace, he was talking about the space program, going to the moon. He was projecting America's best in our hemisphere through the Peace Corps. He was talking about and proposing and, and enforcing the law, uh, you know, 
with respect to the Brown versus Board of Education law and also the uh, the segregate the, all the the different laws that that uh, said segregation was illegal. He was he was enforcing those laws, and it was to his own political detriment to do that. He was showing a lot of courage, and the younger generation, and indeed a lot of the older people, respected that. And so uh, he was only president for a thousand days. If you think about it, you know he. he 1960 to 63 and in that time if you ask kennedy he would say and he wrote this that his most his crowning achievement was signing the nuclear test ban treaty which happened uh in in 63 and this was the result of some secret negotiations some back channeling between him and khrushchev where you know against all the advice of his cabinet against all the advice of his joint chiefs and all the military and cia personnel that advise him he said you know we're on a road to uh armageddon and somebody has to be the adult here and so they negotiated a nuclear test ban treaty to uh scale back and begin to draw down uh this this uh, approach that we've been taking towards this abyss and of course there are a lot of people who thought that he gave away the nuclear advantage that america had there were a lot of folks believe it or not who were advising him that if we were ever going to have a war with Russia, now was the time because we had the nuclear advantage. And yes, they had already calculated there would be so many millions of Americans who would die, but it was worth the risk. It was worth the cost. Let's let's do it now. And of course, these were the same people advising him in the Bay of Pigs disaster and the, and the Cuban Missile Crisis, and all this. And through it all, JFK stood firm. JFK said, no, I'm not going to be the man who annihilates the earth. I'm not going to be that person. And uh, so all, some of this we learned later after his death, but uh, nevertheless, it's a uh, it's some of the reason why his his image has grown over time. Uh, the thousand days he was president, the Kennedy administration, uh, and this was sort of a marketing thing that came about as a result of some smart people in his administration and, and in the media, uh, began to link his young with it administration because he had brought in the best and brightest in his cabinet he'd hired a lot of recent harvard graduates a lot of folks that were young the administration had completely turned over from old to young and they called it administration camelot and it had this mystical error to it uh this with it cool suave uh and of course if you ever heard JFK in a press conference, he was extremely likable. He had a great sense of humor, a very quick wit. Uh, he, he, there was a give and take between him and the media. Uh, David Halberstram, the best and the brightest, uh, profiled this. And uh, in his book, The Best and the Brightest, he, he had an inside look at the Kennedy administration. He, he went through and he profiled all of his, uh, JFK himself with all of his advisors and the genius of these advisors and their and their approach to life and a uh, leadership and it was just new it was refreshing and and the uh the reference to king arthur and the knights and the round table and all that just played into it uh it became the thing to do to go to these extravagant white house galas and balls it was everybody's wish to be invited to one of these social functions because the president was going to be there. And, and even more importantly, Jackie was going to be there. And so, uh, you know, you're talking about a time that was very glamorous in Washington, D.C. You have presidents that come along that are functional, uh, that, that are adults. They're, they're, they have a lot of gravitas like, like Eisenhower did. And then you have presidents like uh, Kennedy, who have the gravitas, but also have the glamour and the youth and the vigor and the energy. It's rare that you get that combination. When you do, people really are proud of it and they they uh, latch on to it and they, they want to brag about it. There was another element to the Kennedy family that uh, people began to notice in this youth. Uh, had, it was a double-edged sword. I mean, number on one hand, it could get us into some trouble, but on the other hand, the vision, the energy could really lead us in some positive directions. Furthermore, if JFK did a credible job as president, there was a, a lineup or a, a, 
a batting order behind him that could create a, could possibly create a Kennedy dynasty. Uh, here you see Bobby pictured on the left. That was his younger brother. And he was picked by JFK, his older brother, to be the attorney general. Of course, he would run for president in 68. And the plan was, and of course, Daddy Joe came up with this plan, was that JFK would run for president in 60, serve two terms, be followed up by Bobby, who would serve the next two terms from 68 to 76. And then Teddy would run in 76 and serve two terms. And here you have 24 years of Kennedys. And uh, all they all they have to do is is be credible leaders, and and they're going to be a a force to be reckoned with in the future, politically speaking. And of course, as history proves, Kennedy did run in sixty, did win. Bobby did run in sixty eight, didn't make it to the election because he himself was assassinated. And Teddy did run in seventy six, but didn't get the nomination. So, uh, though it didn't work out to plan, it was being set up, and people could see that. Uh, Samuel L. Morrison, a Harvard University professor of history, wrote that courage is one of the qualifications of a great president. Kennedy had the power of decision. And we're going to talk about a lot of those decisions that he made. And they all required courage. They all came at a cost. Unfortunately for Kennedy, they came at a very high cost. But he still showed the courage to make them. And uh, Morrison said Kennedy had the power of decision, of correct decisions as well as quick decisions. Think about Bay of Pigs when the military came to him and said, let's escalate, send in the air support. And he said, no. Think about the Cuban Missile Crisis when those same military advisors and CIA came to him and said, let's bomb the missile sites. Let's uh, invade the island. Wisely, Kennedy said no to both. These are quick decisions and they're correct decisions. There were no hesitations, no faltering. No other president other than Abraham Lincoln and Franklin Delano Roosevelt had to make so many important decisions within his presidency. And he had to do it in a thousand days. And, you know, he made some early mistakes, but he adjusted very quickly. Uh, I think one of the biggest reasons, uh, too, is that he was, you know, he, every president is captured to, the, to world events. And there were some very large world events that happened, very significant world events that happened while JFK was president. I just mentioned a couple, Bay of Pigs, uh, Cuban Missile Crisis, there was also a Berlin Wall that was built. Uh, we had the uh, it was it was the beginning of a Cold War in, in, in space program, space race between us and the Russians. Uh, we had a lot of civil rights things that we'll be discussing later. Uh, the James Meredith situation down at Ole Miss. Um, there was just a lot of important things happening. That the president had to respond to, had to make decisions, and he was tested under fire in those moments. I think probably the biggest reason why JFK is so unique and, and his the interest in him has grown to this day and continues to this day is because he didn't live long enough to tarnish his own image now that doesn't mean that we haven't learned things about kennedy in his personal life that didn't tarnish his image as far as a political leader as far as a a president is concerned his image and his reputation has grown it's been burnished not tarnished and he died young in his prime uh and the younger, the, the biggest generation in our history already claimed him as their own, and they all remembered where they were on the moment that he died, and the mystery around his death, and all that has continued over the years, and uh, his his reputation, his image, the importance, his legacy has grown and grown and grown. He died tragically in his prime. In other words, he was a martyr, and martyrs always are bigger in death than they were in life, and so I think these are some of the reasons why Kennedy has become uh, and, continue, has, and continues to be one of the uh, most significant presidents of the 20th century. And this is why, why students today, 60 years after his death, uh, have no connection to JFK himself personally, uh, and yet are very connected to his story and want to learn more. And uh, so consequently, those are some of the reasons. And there may be, there may be others, but those are some that I think gets us off to a good start, understanding the context around Kennedy, his time as president, his time on earth as a leader in American politics. And indeed, I think he became more than just a political leader. I think he became an image of America that Americans were proud of. Thank you. Um,